Thank you, and I want to thank the Mercatus uh, for having us today. Uh, Congressman Mack and I are kind of a team, um, and, and our approach to this will be in a team way. I'm going to paint the bleak picture that really points out why we need to do what he and I are doing. And uh, he actually recruited me on the, on the Penny Plan, and uh, it's an outstanding idea. It's gaining traction. It's easy to understand and easy to explain. And America's been doing that as individuals, but they don't understand why the country can't do it. So, but in order to get people to understand why we need to make a cut at all, they need to understand the situation that our country's in. Now, the Senate had a bill that would have formed a debt commission, and that debt commission was charged with finding a plan for solving the debt. Now, unfortunately, some of the people that co-sponsored the amendment, did not, the bill, did not vote for it because they were afraid that it would wind up just raising taxes, and as a result, it didn't pass. But the president saw the value of doing that, and he appointed a debt commission, and he had Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson be the co-chairs on it. And uh, they did some very impressive work, um, mostly in pointing out the detrimental situation that our country's in right now. And that's, that's a real key. You've got to understand how bad it is. You can't just imagine that we can keep printing money and spending money and doing new programs, all of which are really good ideas, well, most of them are. Some of them are really bad ideas. But uh, we just keep spending money. And uh, <clears throat> the president, uh, when he did his State of the Union message, I was hoping would paint the bleak picture that that, that, that debt commission did. But he didn't. Instead, he presided, he presented a budget. And the budget was another stimulus. And the budget called for a lot more spending. And a year ago, the Senate voted on that. And the vote on it was 97 to nothing. Now, he had to present another budget this year, and he did pretty much the same thing, and the vote on it was in the House this year, and it was 414 to nothing. That's not a solution. You know, if you have that kind of a defeat, you've got to look someplace else for it, and I think this penny plan is one place we can go for it. But we have a national debt that's approaching $16 trillion. Now, I don't know of anybody that knows what a trillion is. But I have seen a t-shirt by a young person that said, please don't tell them what comes after a trillion. <clears throat> That's what you're faced with. Every man, woman, and child in the United States right now owes $49,000 in federal debt. That's besides any other debt that you have. And if the country collapses, we may have to collect on that. Wouldn't be possible, would it? $49,000. Now, you've seen what's been happening in Greece and Italy. In Greece and Italy, they've been having riots. And one of the reasons they have riots is they had to do a 19% cut in one year. 19%. That's, that's of absolutely everything. They had to end government contracts. They had to cut pensions. Everything got cut. Now, I said that we owe $49,000 per person. In Italy, they only owe $40,000 per person. In Greece, they only owe $39,000 per person. But with this debt, the bond rates are going up dramatically. In the last month, they went up 30 points. Now, if that continues, in 10 years, we'll owe $26 trillion, and the only thing we'll be able to do is pay the interest on the debt. It will take every dime of tax revenue that we have and may require additional taxes just to cover the interest. It won't pay for Medicare, it won't pay for Medicaid, it won't pay for Social Security, it won't pay for uh, defense or education or anything else that you see the federal government participating in. As an accountant, it keeps me up nights. And I've checked with the other accountant, it keeps him up nights too. Now we do a, a lot of things to make it look like it's not as bad. Whenever we bring up a bill now, we say, well, we're going to offset that. We're going to get a pay for for it. And so we find some other place in the budget to steal some money and put it toward the new program. Well, let me tell you, in the uh, highway bill that's being debated right now, trying to be conferenced, part of that money came from pensions. There's a thing called the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. 
that companies have to pay in a fee in case they go broke, then that can pick up their pension fund. Well, that increase in fee is going to the highways now. We also did this clever little thing of saying, well, there are some areas where in 10 years there would be this much revenue, and that much revenue would fund two years of the highway bill. Well, what are we going to do two years from now? We're still waiting for eight years' worth of revenue to come in to pay for what we've already spent. How many years out can you go before the bankers, which are the bondholders, which are you if you buy bonds, gonna, before you say, no more of that. We're not going to buy an American bond. Now, another little trick that we do is we do issue U.S. bonds to things like Social Security. Any time in the past that there was a surplus, what we did was spend the money and put an IOU in the drawer called a bond. And the way I found this out is we had a little thing called abandoned mine land in, in Wyoming where the companies were putting in so that we could fix abandoned mine lands. But the federal government kept holding that in trust. And when I got here, I said, I need to get that money. We need to be fixing some of the abandoned mines in Wyoming. And they said, well, if you put some money in, you can take some money out. I said, what kind of a bank account is that? It's a trust fund. Well, we found a way to, to do that. It, did, it just added to, well, it just kept the federal debt at the same level. But we are in a crisis, and we have to do something about it. And if you hope to have any of the federal benefits, you need to join one or more of the plans that will fix the budget. So what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Congressman Mack, who will explain to you how the penny plan works. And uh, this, this is the solution that will sell in America and really work. And I appreciate him recruiting me for it and others here who worked on recruiting me. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you. And I also want to thank the uh, Mercatus Center for uh, all of your hard work in really trying to ensure we have debate and dialogue about how to solve our debt, our deficits, uh, and get us back on the road to prosperity and off, uh, off the road to Greece. Uh, I also want to, before I begin, to tell you more about the, the Penny Plan, I want to introduce you to somebody who, if it wasn't for him, there wouldn't be a Penny Plan. Uh, and, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I love about this penny plan is it didn't come from all of us smart people here in Washington. It came from business people. It came from citizens around uh, the country who said there's got to be a better way to deal with our fiscal problems. And so this group was formed called the One Cent Solution. And I, I encourage you to go to their website and uh, look at the work that they're doing. Uh, but if Bruce Cook, if you could stand up, I just want everyone to to say hello to Bruce and, uh, and thank you, Bruce, for <laughs> they've been a, a tremendous partner in, uh, in this effort and uh, we look forward to continuing that partnership. You know, things happen in funny ways. So um, I'm, at, I'm at my parents' house one weekend and uh, my father says, you know, I just, I just met with a friend of mine who uh, is part of this group that is looking at ways to balance the budget and they gave me a packet and you ought to take a look at it. I think it's got some real merit. Uh, and that's how we ended up to where we are today with the, uh, the one cent solution or the penny plan, as it's been dubbed. Uh, there is a better way to solve the, the fiscal problems in the United States. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a complicated set of gimmicks and proposals to get there. It can be very simple. Uh, and, it, and it's the simplicity of the penny plan, I think, that really makes it attractive not only to people here in Washington, but people around uh, the country. Uh, so what the Penny Plan does, and it's very simple, we cut 1 percent of spending a year uh, for six years. That's, that's one penny out of every federal dollar. So on, some people will say, well, that's not enough cuts, and others will say that's too much cuts. But it's the only plan that will balance the budget within a 10-year window. Uh, the, the plan that was just passed recently in the House takes roughly 28 years to balance. Uh, and the, with the new projections, we actually think the penny plan can balance the budget within a five-year period. Uh, so what we do, again, is we take 1 percent a year for six years. Then we cap spending at 18 percent of GDP. 
The reason we make we cap it at 18 percent because that is historically where revenues have been. And you know one thing that everyone knows at home is that if you want to balance a budget, your spending has to equal your income or, in this case, revenue. So we cap it at 18 percent, and over a 10-year period we cut $7.5 trillion in debt. So this is a, a simple way for us to move forward. Now, we have got a lot of support for this plan. We have 72 members of the House who have co-sponsored. We have got uh, 12 or 13 members of the Senate who have co-sponsored the bill. Uh, we have got uh, outside support from Freedom Works and the One Cent Solution uh, team. We have also got uh, support from uh, radio talk show host and television uh, uh, host uh, Sean Hannity. And we even have bipartisan support with uh, Lanny Davis, formerly with the Clinton administration, who has uh, written in favor of, of the penny plan. So this is a, a common sense way for us to, to balance our budget. And I want to put it into perspective, if I could, uh, before we, we begin the uh, panel discussion. But so the, in the last over three years, the Senate hasn't even bothered to pass a budget. And in the House, we've passed a budget with a lot of reforms and uh, uh, changes and uh, things involved in the budget that some people are happy with and some people aren't. But at least we have a plan that we put out there. What concerns me, though, is the only plan that has been voted on and moved forward is a plan that wouldn't balance the budget for 28 years. 28 years. So let me put that into context. I've got a nine-year-old son. Uh, if we were to adopt this plan that wouldn't balance for 28 years, that means he's going to go to high school, get his driver's license, graduate from college, get a job, married, start a family, saving for his retirement, looking at how he's going to try to pay for his children's college. All of that's going to happen before we balance the budget. And as the Senator said earlier, right now, if we didn't add a dime to the debt, every man, woman, and child in America owes close to $50,000. Imagine what that's going to be like if we wait 28 years. So I, I'm, I'm begging, I'm, in, I'm asking people that we have to come together, we have to work together to find a way to balance the budget. And the penny plan uh, is a simple yet effective way to do it that says the Congress and the President will work together to make the cuts but if the Congress and the President fail, then there will be across-the-board cuts, that we can't continue to put this debt on the backs of our children and grandchildren and expect America to be the place where prosperity is growing, where the hopes and dreams of young Americans can be met. So thank you, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest. Thank you to the Mercatus Center. Uh, I know you are going to have a great panel discussion today. And um, we look forward to the outcomes and continuing to work with the, uh, with the Center and, balance, and eventually balancing our budget. Thank you very much. I will ask our uh, scholars to come join us now. As a research center, Mercatus does not oppose or endorse any legislation or any candidates for office, but we do look at things and say they do have merit or they don't have merit or they meet certain principles or don't have certain principles involved. And we try and be a real bridge, as you can see in our logo, we're the bridge between academic ideas and practical solutions. And so that brings us to the scholarly panel. We're extremely fortunate to have with us today Dr. Jim Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller is an expert on various public policy issues, including federal and state regulatory programs, fiscal finance, tax structure, federal and state spending and deficits, <clears throat> excuse me, public choice, campaign finance. He has done it all in his career. Uh, from October 1985 to October 1988, Dr. Miller was the director of the U.S. Office of Management and Budget and was a member of President Reagan's cabinet and a member of the Security Council as well. Uh, from October 81 to October 85, he was also chairman of the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. And prior to that, he was the head of 
Information and Regulatory Affairs at OMB, where he administered, among other things, President Reagan's program for regulatory relief. Dr. Miller holds a BBA in Economics from the University of Georgia and a PhD in Economics from the University of Virginia. He is the author of so many articles and books I could not begin to tell you how many. Currently, he is a senior advisor to Hush and Blackwell LLP, which is an international commercial law firm. And he is a distinguished fellow of the Center for Public Choice at George Mason University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Miller. Thank you, sir. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks to Congressman Mack, Senator Enzi, for supporting or sponsoring the Penny Plan. And thanks to the Makeda Center for holding this event. You know, economists are often criticized for their focus on material well-being. It's somewhat unfair criticism as if that's the only thing they care about, but it is, after all, their occupation. Besides, material well-being tends to be inversely related to many ills, such as crime, suicide, social unrest, and unhealthy lifestyles, among others. So the economic pie and its rate of growth are very important. The economic pie consists of billions of decisions made every year. From Economics 101, we learned how private markets work. You have multiple demanders and multiple suppliers responding to those demands. The system works very, very well. Not perfectly in every circumstance, but it works very, very well. Now, less is known about how public, collective, government markets work. Private suppliers, excuse me, what we do know is that governments tend to consume more than is optimal, in part because decision makers face, typically face, incorrect signals. The benefits accrue to constituents while others pay for them. Now, add to that the fact that providing benefits to constituents helps ensure reelection, and you get too much of virtually everything. Moreover, the size of the economic pie need not be static, and its, and its division need not be zero sum. The size of government affects the size of the pie as well as its distribution. And the evidence is fairly clear that we are way past the size of government that maximizes the size and rate of growth of the economic pie. So how do we constrain the size of the federal government? Well, the Congressional Budget Act of 1974 required Congress to agree to total spending as a way of constraining the free riding problem stemming from the incentives individual members have to get goodies for themselves and offload the cost on someone else, and for committees to get their bigger share, you know, the 302Bs and all that sort of stuff. But it hasn't really worked. Congress has ignored the deadlines and restrictions, restraints incorporated in the budget resolution. And it doesn't include the president in the process. I once had lunch with Bill Gray in the White House mess, and I said, Bill, you know, we've got a real problem here because the the dates required by the budget resolution are not being met. I'm an economist. You can understand why I would think of incentives. Why don't we think of the following kind of incentives? If the budget resolution is not passed on the date incorporated in the Act, then you cut the pay of members of Congress in half. And maybe the same thing for cabinet officers or something like that. He said, Jim, I like your idea of incentives, but why don't we do it this way? If they meet the requirements, Members of Congress get a bonus. <laughs> I said, I don't think that's going to fly. Now, next we address the overall spending question with the graham rubin hollings law. Set, it set declining deficit targets, which if not met, resulted in spending cuts by a merciless robot. It worked for a while, but Congress panicked and changed the targets and then later abandoned them. Other approaches have been attempted. For example, President Clinton's line item veto, which was passed and then found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Also, constitutional spending limitations. 
which an idea which was championed by the Reagan administration and others and has gone nowhere. And then there were, at the federal level at least, and then there was the 1990 budget deals PAYGO provision, which in practice worked mainly to justify tax increases, not spending cuts. Now, speaking of the tax side, nothing seems to have worked quite like Grover Norquist's no tax pledge. Maybe we should have a no spending, that is a no spending increase pledge for members of Congress as well. But both of these approaches deal with what is rather than what, where it should be. Now, in that vein, I'm impressed by the Mac-Enzi plan. First, its focus is on spending and cut spending from current services 1 percent, a penny on each dollars, for five or six consecutive years. Nominal spending would increase, of course, but only approximately 19 percent as opposed to the 46 percent under the CBO baseline. Second, it caps federal spending at 18 percent of GDP in 1918, oh, excuse me, in 2018, which matches a sustainable level of tax revenue. Can you say balanced budget? Third, it avoids the trap of letting detractors claim that this program or that program is the target that obviously the sponsors have no heart and are more than willing to throw grandma off the cliff. Finally, it is simple, elegant, and understandable. Who can't afford to spend just penny less each year than they had planned? As I was telling Senator Mack, uh, Congressman Mack here, you know, it's, you can imagine someone's going to one of the local meetings with constituents and have somebody stand up and say, can't you cut spending just one penny out of a dollar? Why, we have to do that all the time. The program, like I say, is transparent. It's easily understood. It's elegant, simple. In fact, it's the kind of proposal Ronald Reagan might well have championed. Thank you. Our next panelist today, and I think I can say this without, uh, without too much hubris, is one of the bright rising stars in the academic world, Dr. Jason Fickner. He is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University where his primary research interests include social security, federal tax policy, federal budget policy, retirement security, and policies to increase savings and investment. Previously, Dr. Fickner served in several positions in government. He was with the Social Security Administration as acting deputy commissioner, chief economist, and associate commissioner for retirement policy. He's also served here on Capitol Hill as a senior economist for the Joint Economic Committee. Dr. Fickner earned his B.A. from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and his Master's in Public Policy from Georgetown University, and he holds a Ph.D. in Public Administration and Policy from Virginia Tech University. In addition to his duties at Mercatus, we uh, can find Dr. Fickner on a number of our best campuses in the area. He is adjunct professor at Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, and Virginia Tech. So without further ado, Dr. Jason Fickner. Thank you, Jim. So first of all, thank you for being here. It's always hard to follow three very distinguished speakers. I'm always afraid when I get up here, you're all going to run for the door. Uh, but I want to thank Senator Enzi and Congressman Mack for being here and supporting the plan. Also, uh, Jim Miller and Chris Edwards for being here as well. And to sort of um, reinforce something that Congressman Mack said, um, this isn't going to happen without some grassroots support. So he already gave. Um, a shout out to Bruce Cook, and I want to thank him as well, because one of the things we're seeing is we do sort of discussions on the Hill, we talk to uh, other academics, I teach classes, people keep saying, we don't trust Congress to do this, they don't think we can get it done. This is going to take really grassroots support and grassroots mobilization from the people to really tell members of Congress and the administration this has to get done and how to do it. Um, so I want to thank you for your efforts. And I also want to thank uh, Jim Carter, hopefully somewhere around here still. Uh, there he is. Uh, Jim Carter co-authored, not bed with me in the Washington Times, which I think is in your packet. 
He's also been a concerned citizen about these issues, so thank you as well. So one of the things that I like is I'm a guy who does show and tell and loves charts. Um, so here's just kind of what I want to show you. Why do we care about something like the one cent solution or the penny plan or the one percent solution? However you want to call it, the idea is why are we caring about cutting spending? Why is that so important to us? You'll see there basically you have red lines and blue lines. The red line is our outlays. Uh, the dotted line across is the average from post-World War II. The blue lines are our revenues. And you'll see that the average revenue is about 18 percent since post-World War II. And you'll also see what's of interest is the red line keeps going up and up and up. And the blue line kind of goes up too, but this is assuming congressional budget office figures for current law. This assumes the Bush tax cuts are going to expire at the end of this year. This assumes that the payroll tax cut will expire at the end of this year. For the outlays, it assumes that the dock fix will happen. We'll have a 30 percent cut in position payments. We don't think these are realistic. In other words, the revenue is going to be the uh, revenues will be lower and the outlays will be higher, which means you have deficits widening and widening and widening as far as the eye can see. And why are deficits bad? Because they lead to debt. And what I want to show you here is you hear people talking about debt held by the public or gross debt. Basically, the difference is the gross debt includes all the obligations of the U.S. government, including those that are held in the Social Security and Medicare trust funds. Public debt draws those out. But either way, we're talking about a gross debt of $15 trillion right now. Our national economy, our GDP, is $15 trillion, meaning our debt is 100 percent of GDP. Why is that important? If you look at academic literature, where do countries start to have problems where they see the ability to have payment imbalances? and other kinds of strife, it's when gross debt hits 90 percent of GDP. We're above that. What's been giving us a cushion based on other countries is we're the, the national reserve currency for the world. That only gets you so many years. At some point, that catches up and our interest rates will go back up. We might have a debt crisis. We may have a problem paying our bills. If we don't do something soon, we're going to be like Greece. We have a small window of opportunity in the next few years to actually have some budget reform. These are various proposals, and I kind of want to highlight something. These are various budget proposals put out that reduce the debt. But one thing I want to sort of highlight, the purple line is the Congressional Budget Office alternate fiscal scenario, which says, you know, they have to basically go on current law. But if they do something called current policy, they say, Congress, you've done some things in the past which make us think you might do some things to continue going forward, like some sort of tax cut extension. This is how the budget actually looks to them. This is the alternate fiscal scenario. The other thing is, look at the very bottom green line. That was President Obama's budget submission back in September, yet if you go to the blue line, the second from top, that's his current budget. So the one he submitted in September, he didn't actually believe enough in to reduce the debt, and the one he put in now actually increases the debt. So we still have a debt problem going forward. Why do we care about spending? I don't care what we look at, whether you want to focus on defense, agriculture, all these things need reform, but the true nature of our fiscal crisis is because of entitlements and basically because of health care. Health care is exploding. Um, the trustees' reports just came out this past Monday, both for Social Security and Medicare. The Medicare trust fund is supposed to go insolvent in 2024. If you get to the end of the 300-page report, CMS chief actuary Rick Foster has what they call an actuarial opinion, where he's got to state, what I've done in here confines to professional ethics, conducts, and laws, and all the uh, methodologies we adhere to. They do, but, there's a big caveat, we don't think this is, these assumptions are correct and going to happen based on what Congress has done in the past with like the docs fix and things like that, they don't think actually that Congress can control cost enough and that the 2024 is actually being very, very overly optimistic. 2024 is not that far away. You move that up to 2015, 2018, we're looking at a health care crisis very quickly. You can see we're basically going off the chart when it comes to health care spending. Why is this all so important? As both uh, Senator Enzi and Congressman Mack mentioned, we are getting to the point where our dollars are increasingly being used to pay for not only entitlements, but also for interest on the debt. This is basically looking out to 2082 and seeing how our spending, and what, is, what does a share of one dollar go to? There's discussions that 20 cents of the dollar goes to the government today, it'll be 40 cents tomorrow. What I'm concerned about is we start getting to the point where just the interest on the debt will be 50 cents on the dollar we're paying. Think about all the discussions we're having on Capitol Hill today and how hard it is to pass a budget. Part of the reason is because entitlement spending is taking up a larger and larger share of that one dollar, and what is left for discretionary spending is getting smaller and smaller. It's sort of like thinking about a pack of hungry dogs, and all of a sudden you cut the food in half, the pack of hungry dogs, they're going to fight harder. That's why it's been harder and harder to get budget deals going on here, because the discretionary pot is smaller. It's going to get even smaller going forward. And for those of you that are wondering, this assumption is based on CBO's uh, overall interest rate assumption of about a 4.5 percent interest rate. What if we have to start paying 5, 
five and a half, six, seven. The general rule of thumb is for 100 basis points, a 1% increase in the interest rate, we add $1 trillion over 10 years to our interest costs. If our interest costs explode, this gets worse. So this is why we're sort of focusing on the need for spending. And this is how it looks right now when you look at the extended baseline scenario for CBO. That's their current law. Their alternate fiscal scenario, which I think is more reality, and the President's FY13 budget submission, which a lot of us don't think is reality. The alternate fiscal scenario is what we're facing. If we don't put something in place that literally forces Congress to cut spending or to actually budget without having like the sort of Damocles over the head that says, if you can't budget and reduce spending, these cuts go in automatically, we're stuck on the alternate fiscal scenario, and that's the problem we're facing. So my last chart for you is a lot of lines. Um, the bottom ones are revenues, the top ones are outlays. And, and what I've done is sort of a little Congressional Budget Office gimmick. It's very simple. You all can repeat it on your spreadsheet. I've taken the Congressional Budget Office forecast for gross domestic product. It's their GDP looking forward to the next 10 years and said, what if our revenues are 17% of GDP, which would be low from historical standards, 18% of GDP, that is the long-term post-World War II average, or 19% of GDP. So three revenue estimates based on um, GDP for CBO. And then I started with our, with our spending, and I reduced spending 1% a year. All right, we balanced the budget in five years that way. What if people say, well, you can't actually cut 1% a year. That's impossible. There's no way you can do it. We can hold spending constant. In fact, we can do a 1% increase a year. We can allow 2% increase nominally per year in government spending. And under the 18% and 19% of GDP, we still balance the budget this decade. So the fact that Congress can't find some way to really get us on a path of fiscal responsibility and balance the budget in 10 years, I think is a mistake. I think we actually can do it. And this kind of shows you, even just under some basic spreadsheets, you can do it. Of course, it requires budgeting. Budgeting is making hard choices. But in order to force those hard choices, there needs to be a consequence if they're not done. And that's where the one cent solution, the penny plan, however you want to call it, comes into play. Uh, and our next speaker is going to tell us actually how we can even budget to get it done. So thank you for your time. Our final speaker on the panel today is Chris Edwards. Chris is the Director of Tax Policy Studies at the Cato Institute and the editor of a website I would encourage you to take a look at called downsizinggovernment.org. Before joining Cato, Chris was a senior economist on the Congressional Joint Economic Committee and a manager at PricewaterhouseCoopers. He was also an economist for the Tax Foundation. Mr. Edwards has testified before Congress on fiscal issues many times, and like Dr. Miller, is a prolific writer. I won't begin to try and, and list the articles, but you may have seen things in the popular press, in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and a number of other newspapers. He's also the author of Downsizing the Federal Government and co-author of The Global Tax Resolution, Revolution, excuse me, and he holds a BA and MA in economics. He's also a member of the Fiscal Future Committee of the National Academy of Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Chris Edwards. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really happy to be here. And thank, uh, thank you to Mercatus for putting on this event uh, uh, on Bruce, uh, Bruce Cook's One Cent Solution, uh, which, which is a great idea. I am honored to be on a panel with both uh, Jason and Jim. Uh, Jim Miller was one of the reasons why the Reagan administration was different. Jim, uh, as budget director, uh, and, and many other members of the Reagan administration really did try to control spending. I've looked at the histories of dozens and dozens of agencies and programs, and I can tell you that during the Reagan administration, there really was an effort to try to restrain spending, to deregulate, to privatize. The Reagan administration really was different, and we certainly need uh, that sort of administration again. <clears throat> My topic today is why we should cut federal spending. First, I'll give you three sort of big picture reasons why we need to cut federal spending. Uh, the first, Jason sort of addressed, if we don't cut spending, we're, we're heading to a Greek-style debt crisis in this country. A second uh, sort of big picture reason to cut federal spending is that federal spending is less efficient at the margin than private sector spending. In other words, uh, government in the United States now is around 40% of GDP. 
uh, it's pretty obvious to me that an additional uh, uh, amount of resources going in the public sector uh, is going to be less efficient than if it, it, re it was remained in the private sector. So the more government spending we do, uh, the more the GDP is reduced. And third, higher federal spending ultimately leads to higher federal taxes. Taxes uh, aren't extracted from the economy costlessly. Uh, taxes create distortions in the economy, which again reduces GDP. So those are sort of big picture reasons why we need to reduce uh, spending. Uh, and there's lots of ideas for sort of big picture caps on spending uh, that uh, uh, Republicans and others are looking at. Uh, the one cent solution uh, is, is sort of an idea of, of capping the overall budget. Discretionary spending caps passed last year uh, are, are the same idea of sort of capping overall spending. But I spend a lot of my time looking at the details of federal spending programs and agencies. And there's a hell of a lot of reasons to cut particular programs when you start looking at the actual performance of these programs over time. And so I'll give you eight reasons to cut particular programs. When you start looking at the history of particular agencies and programs, here are eight things that, that, uh, that often uh, arise and uh, are good reasons to cut cut programs. One, many federal programs violate constitutional federalism. In other words, they're not proper responsibilities for the federal government. I mean, federal spending on things like public housing and local transit and that sort of stuff, these aren't properly federal roles for, for the government. They are local responsibilities. Uh, two, many federal programs are unfair giveaways to special interests. Uh, farm subsidies, a classic example of that. Three, many federal programs distort the economy. Uh, housing subsidies, energy subsidies, in my view, these programs damage the economy, uh, don't help the economy. Uh, four, many federal programs uh, create social problems. I mean, a classic example here is welfare pro programs and other low, uh, programs for low-income Americans create dependency and reduce individual responsibility, so they are damaging to society, in my view. Uh, fifth, many federal programs uh, reduce individual freedom. All these subsidies pour out of Washington, and with all these subsidies are, are masses amounts of regulation that go with all these subsidy programs. So farmers, for example, may get their subsidies, but they're also subject to all kinds of federal rules that tell them how to farm and, and uh, how not to farm and what to farm and that sort of stuff. So federal spending ultimately reduces individual freedom. Six, many federal programs harm the environment. Uh, I recently wrote a, a lengthy essay on water subsidies. The federal government pumps out billions of dollars uh, of water subsidies in western United States, which artificially depresses the price of water, causing overconsumption. And there are increasing water crises uh, in the west of the United States caused by these uh, uh, federal subsidies and uh, artificially low water prices. Uh, seven, many federal programs are mismanaged and fraud ridden. We all know that. I was looking uh, uh, on the plaque outside of this room, which mentioned that that this room was the site of the uh, hearings on the Teapot Dome scandal in 1922. Uh, if I remember my history, uh, the Teapot Dome scandal was a scandal about the Secretary of the Interior um, um, secretly and illegally uh, handing out uh, mineral leases to uh, his business uh, uh, buddies in various parts of the country. So federal corruption has been here a long time. And finally, eight, uh, many federal programs simply don't work. Uh, I recently wrote an essay on federal programs uh, for Native Americans, for American Indians. And for 150 years, federal policies have frankly been a total disaster. We have pumped out billions of dollars of subsidies decade after decade uh, to Indian reservations, and, this, and these programs simply haven't worked. Uh, they've, frankly, they've been a disaster. Uh, and so for all these reads, we need to look at each program uh, program by program and find out whether they've worked and what worked and, and what we can terminate. So overall caps on the budget, like the one cent solution, are great, but we also need members of Congress starting to champion cuts and terminations to particular programs. Uh, I run Cato's website, downsizinggovernment.org, which uh, is sort of a guide agency by agency uh, in, in what we can cut in Washington. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, and Jason touched on some of the big entitlements, Social Security and Medicare. Those are clearly the biggest problem we have in the federal budget. But I think another area where we need to cut is federal aid to the states. Uh, the federal government spends over $600 billion a year in over 1,100 different aid to state programs. 
things like K-12 education and housing and transit and many other properly local activities. Uh, I think the correct amount of federal aid to the states is zero. Uh, I think uh, uh, federal aid to the states uh, leads to bad governance and uh, uh, it damages the economy. I mean, a brief history here is before Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s, there virtually was, there was hardly any federal aid uh, at all. Federal aid exploded under Lyndon Johnson. Uh, the Reagan administration under Jim and, and uh, Budget Director David Stockman tried to cut back on aid to the states, and they were somewhat successful. Uh, but unfortunately, aid has exploded again in the post-Reagan uh, years. There's many reasons why federal aid to the state doesn't make any sense. Uh, the 50 states are supposed to be laboratories of democracy. Uh, unfortunately, they aren't. When federal subsidies pour out of Washington, uh, education subsidies, for example, they put a straight jacket on healthy policy diversity uh, uh, in the states that No Child Left Behind. Education law is a good example of that. Uh, I want the 50 states to go their own way with uh, education policy and all kinds of other policies. I think, that's, I think that's healthy that the states compete with each other without being controlled by Washington. I think federal aid misallocates resources. Uh, there's no reason why a, a committee of politicians in Washington uh, should be making decisions about highway spending uh, across this vast nation. Uh, the highway money should stay in the states. It should be, should be spent in the states. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, I think, uh, uh, not only to economists, but I think to a lot of average citizens. Uh, and, uh, you know, federal aid to the state, frankly, distracts federal politicians um, from properly federal and national issues. So uh, that's an area I think we need to be talking about. I, I'm glad to see in the Paul Ryan budget, he does, uh, he does uh, propose block granting Medicaid and some other aid to state programs. That's a real start at reform. Uh, so to conclude, you know, I think federal spending, uh, federal spending cuts uh, are not a negative thing. They're a very positive thing. They're often portrayed as sort of a negative thing in the media. Uh, I think federal spending cuts would enhance individual freedom. I think they would enhance state policy diversity. And I think they would spur economic growth. And uh, Mercatus and other people have talked a lot about Canada's fiscal reforms in the 1990s, and they provide sort of a real-world uh, model or example that we ought to be looking at. In the early 90s, Canada faced a huge fiscal crisis like we face now. Spending was out of control. Their debt and deficits were out of control. But Canada turned course very quickly and started cutting. In the mid-90s, they actually cut spending overall federal spending by 10 percent in just two years. So that, that would be like us cutting $400 billion out of the budget in just two years. It was a pretty dramatic cut. Uh, overall federal spending in Canada plunged from 23 percent of GDP in the 90s to, to just 16 percent today. Now down here, if you talk about spending cuts, the Keynesian economists like Mark Zandi come out of the woodwork and they say, oh, that's going to be terrible for the economy. It'll push us back into recession. Uh, Canada uh, refutes that uh, notion completely. Canada started cutting in the mid-90s, and they cut continuously for years. The economy uh, was launched into a 15-year economic boom. Uh, the Canadian economy grew stronger than the American economy. The unemployment rate is lower than the American economy. So uh, there is real-world real experience out there on countries uh, doing spending cuts uh, with good results. Um, so uh, in sum, I'm going to leave it there. Spending cuts work. Uh, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that some uh, fiscal conservatives on, on Capitol Hill, like uh, uh, Connie Mack and others, are looking at some of these overall budget restraints, so that's a great start. But I think we also need to look at terminating uh, programs and agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was excellent. Now is the time in the program that I always enjoy most. It is when we have questions and answers so we can hear what's on your mind. Uh, Ashley Schiller is going to be coming to you with a microphone, so please uh, let her get to you. And Ashley, I see you have a question right in the back right now. My boss certainly supports achieving a balanced budget as soon as possible, including within 10 years, and supported the Republican Study Committee uh, budget, which uh, would do that. At the same time, I have a little bit of a question and concern potentially with the penny plan. As I understand it, it would uh, base the reduction off of the current year spending uh, as opposed to the baseline. So like for something like Medicare, um, let's just say that spends about $500 billion today. It's projected to spend about a trillion by 2022, uh, so about in six years, $800 billion. Let's just say that's roughly where it's at. So instead of spending $500 billion today, the 1% over six years 
is $5 billion a year, you know, a little bit less, so $30 billion. So we're spending $470 or $475 billion in 2018, where it's projected to spend $800 billion. And those are fairly rough numbers. Um, and that's because of the fact that 10,000 baby boomers are joining the program every day. Um, and because of healthcare costs, and, and, and you know the situation. I'm just saying, from a practical perspective, to be able to sell to the American people spending, instead of $800 billion, $470 billion on Medicare, uh, that's huge benefit cuts, put very simply. Please address those concerns, how members like my, my boss, who's certainly inclined to agree with you with respect to addressing our nation's debt crisis, how would you recommend responding to that? If you don't mind, only in Washington, do you actually, someone call a cut, when you actually reduce the growth of spending, do they actually call it a cut? So that's the first thing we have to get over, and the idea is we're actually looking at last year, instead of looking at a real baseline, not a current policy baseline, but it's not just taking every program 1 percent, it's saying you have to make choices. We want the overall top level number to 1 percent less. If you want to have higher Medicare spending, higher Medicaid spending, higher Social Security, you can do it, but you've got to cut more from someplace else. So it really is going to the American people and saying, Here's our priorities. Our priorities are to reduce debt and reduce government spending, make it smaller. Again, Chris Edwards has identified a lot of areas where he's shown there's waste and abuse, there's areas the government shouldn't even be involved in. Those would cut more than 1 percent from the budget, which allows you to spend more or cut less from someplace else. So that's the first way I'd package it. The second is, again, I'm a big fan of, of the 10-year glide path just in general. We didn't get in this fiscal problem overnight. We're not going to solve it overnight. You can't just say we'll balance the budget in 24 hours. Now is it not realistic, but the shock to the economy would just, would just ruin it. So well, what do you do over 10 years? Well, one of the reasons why I put that chart up at the very end is saying you can even cut, you can even hold government spending constant, allow 1%. You can do one cut, 1% 1 cut, hold constant, 1% increase, 2% increase. You still get there. So the thing is, it's having a discussion that spending is the problem. We can cut more or less from someplace else, but it really is reducing it to something that is more in line with the family and American people think is realistic, as opposed to looking at these unrealistic baselines and saying we're cutting from a baseline which is unrealistic to start in the first place, I think. Would you take the risk? Well, it's, uh, <clears throat> I, as I indicated, I think it's a, very important that you get people to agree to the macro picture first. And those are numbers or concepts that, or, that people, when they sit down at their dinner table, talk about. You know, we've got to cut back, we've got to do something, we've got to save some here and there. And then that makes it easier for advocates of spending restraint to make their case because then they don't get down in the mud and have to debate over the allegations made by the other side that what you want to do is throw grandma off the cliff. Um, and it was just as Jason was saying, you just force the members of Congress to make the hard decisions. But if you get the public to give the members a mandate that you've got to cut spending, and I agree with uh, Chris, or maybe it was Jason was saying, only in Washington, you know, do you characterize a cut in the rate of growth of spending as a cut in spending. You know, if you go to your member of Congress's um, local constituent meetings and have someone stand up and say, how much, after they claim to have voted for spending cuts, you ask them, well, what was spending last year? And they, well, I want a number. What's the spending going to be this year? Please give me a number. If the second number is higher than the first number, they didn't cut spending. And that's the way most people think about spending cuts and spending increases. So you've got a major problem of communication efficiencies and it allows members of Congress who are proponents of more spending a way of deceiving people. And one thing to do is to try to keep that from happening. 
I would say, uh, uh, to, to add to, the, to those comments, which I agree with, is you know one way to achieve a, a freeze or a 1 percent cut is block granting. And that is why I am really pleased that, that Paul Ryan and the House Republicans are looking at block granting. Uh, you can save an enormous amount of money if you just sort of block grant Medicaid and freeze it uh, over 10 years. Uh, it is a way to really stop spending in, in, in its tracks. And, of course, Liberals will say, well, that will put hardship on the States. But then, you know, personally, I would take uh, a trade of the Federal Government uh, cutting spending and taxes by, you know, a dollar or a billion dollars and have the, the States decide whether or not they want to raise taxes and spending by a billion dollars to make up the difference. Uh, I want to get the power and the spending out of Washington. Next question. Could I, could I just mention that a point that is really important for us to think about, and I think it was one point that Chris made, is that at the margin, when you spend a dollar in the private sector, you are spending a dollar for dollar's value. In the government sector, sector when you spend a dollar, when the, you have a dollar of outlay by the Federal Government, we are really spending much more than a dollar. A dollar may be dollar thirty cents, dollar forty cents, dollar sixty cents, depends on this, because of the signals that you get and because of the cost of raising the funds. And so you're not, the point is that you're, <laughs> at the margin, you're not getting a dollar's worth of value in the public sector for what you think is a dollar that you're spending. We have time for one more question. Uh, Aaron Taylor, Senate Finance. I'm going to guess, just from the people I know in this room, that the majority of us agree on uh, getting the nation's fiscal house in order. So I'm wondering on this plan particularly, what uh, you're doing to reach out to offices that would oppose this, and uh, what are you doing to try and recruit them to get on board? One of the things we do is have events like this so we actually can have discourse and conversation. And again, I talk about government spending and reducing spending all the time, and Jim Miller does, Chris Edwards definitely does. So we engage in conversation. And, and one of the things I think is, is helpful, and again, I actually, Senate Finance had testified before the committee a few weeks ago, both parties, all the members in the Senate Finance are really interested in trying to find solutions, uh, including on tax reform. And I think that what we need to do is have more of this open discourse amongst committee members, senators, representatives, people, so we actually can talk about what are our real challenges. I've been doing radio interviews all week on the Social Security Trust Funds, and you still have some House members going out and saying there's no problem because the trust funds are there until 2033. That, that's not actually, the, you know, our cash position is actually a lot worse than that. We're starting to feel pressure now because we have a 2 percent payroll tax cut, which means we have to go out and borrow the money to put it in the trust fund. So we're borrowing from foreign creditors to pay us a 2 percent payroll tax holiday. That's putting pressure on the fiscal position right now. So trying to get real information out and having a real discussion is the first part, and we're doing things like this to try to help get the word out to all offices and all people. And again, people like Bruce Cook, who does this as well for on the grassroots. It's got to start somewhere, and we hope at some point it goes viral and gets out more and more. And I think uh, looking at the time, uh, our time has expired, and I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you will uh, join us for our next Capitol Hill event. Capitol Hill Campus will be back next week with Regulation University, and we hope that you will come to our website and sign up to join us for our next course. Uh, Capitol Hill Campus doesn't give degrees, but the learning never stops. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you very, very soon. Thanks, Jim. Well, do you look at this?